Well, welcome everybody. Glad you're here today. And welcome everybody for all of you that are joining us online today. And if you haven't been with us over the last couple of weeks, we've been walking through this series that we've called True North. We've been talking about how abiding in Jesus, Jesus resting in his design, and being spiritually aware uh, can kind of really define us, right? Really define where we are with the gospel being our foundation. As we seek to walk on this spirit filled journey in this sin filled world, we've defined the gospel as kind of our heading. The gospel is our true north. It's what's lighting our pathway. It is what we walk to strive in. We said it's what keeps us grounded in our walk. It's what keeps us rooted in Jesus even in the midst of chaos. Philippians chapter 1 is where we're going to be at today. And my prayer is that we can take all the truths that we've talked about over the last couple of weeks, over the last three weeks, everything that we've talked about, abiding in Jesus, resting in Him, being free from all of uh, being in the promised life, all of those things that we've talked about, being walking in the gospel, growing in the gospel, all of those things, that we can wrap it up and walk out of here and say this last month, God, you have equipped us to be better tomorrow than we were before we started this journey a month ago. So my prayer is that we can leave here answering the question, what do we leave with? that we can leave here with some practical implications, some practical applications that we can really begin to walk in life. My hope is that the last four weeks, including today, has been a challenge for you, and, but also that it's encouraged you, especially in the midst of chaos that we've been walking through. So um, I'm going to read the, the passage of Scripture for the length of it. I'm not going to ask you to stand, but let's begin reading in Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God and all my remembrance of you, Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you all with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. It says, You may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. I want you to know, brothers, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the, go the gospel. Excuse me. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. For the former proclaim Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance, as it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage, now as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to live as it is the flesh, that means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I am hard pressed between the two. My desire to depart would be the Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in the faith, so that in me you may have ample cause of glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Let's pray together. God, thank you. God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the privilege and the freedom that we have to be able to sit and hear it talk. God, I pray that as we close our time together in True North today, that, God, the gospel would forevermore be our heading. That, God, the gospel would be um, the direction in which we walk. God, that the gospel would continue to impact our lives, not just at salvation's point, but, God, that it would be something that impacts our lives every day after that. God, I pray that you would grow us, that you would challenge us, that, God, you would move in our midst today. God, equip your people. God, if you can use me in a part of that, then, God, please do. But if not, get me out of the way that we see you in the fullness of your glory. And it's in your name alone we pray. God, I love you. Amen. What do we know about Philippians? Well, we know a couple of things. Um, we know if you read Acts chapter 16, and it's kind of where we see the church at Philippi started. But the church at Philippi was kind of in a, in a little...
of a bind because Philippi was a really, really, really hard city to do ministry in. Philippi was a, known as a gateway city. There was a huge trading route that walked through Philippi. So it was just this melting pot of culture. People from all over the globe, people from all over the world would come to Philippi to trade and do business and to do whatever it was. So because of that, there was all these different worldviews, all these different religions, all these different thought processes in Philippi. No Christians existed in this city until Acts chapter 16. So can you imagine just the turmoil and all the kind of controversy and all the weirdness that happened as Paul and his ministry team came on the scene in Acts chapter 16 to plant this church? There was a lot of persecution. It was a, a city that was rich and deeply founded in Roman patriotism. A lot of Roman patriarchs were there. So there was this huge, huge, huge Greco-Roman influence there and commitment to Caesar and the emperor. This whole ideal system of Rome is king and the emperor is king. It was a place that was hard because of all of those things. So Paul is reminding the church at Philippi in verse 3. He's, he's in prison as he writes this letter. He says, I thank my God and my, all my remembrance of you. As I think about you and I think about the times that we and I think about doing ministry of you, I am filled with joy and I am encouraged. And I thank God for that. Always in my prayer of mine for you all, all making my prayer with joy. It's not painful memories that I have for you. It's not a painful thought process that I have. I'm remembering some of the things because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Isn't that a good word right there? That he who started this thing off in Acts chapter 16, he's not finished with you yet. Even though you're in a melting pot, even though you're kind of in the pressure cooker where you are in Philippi, God is going to be faithful with you and faithful to you not only until the end of your life, but God is going to continue to be faithful to you until Jesus comes again. Isn't that a good word? Number one, embrace the faithfulness of Jesus. Number one, embrace the faithfulness of Jesus. I am convinced, and I hope you have heard this over the last couple of weeks, I am convinced that the best is yet to come. I am convinced that our God is not done saving souls. I am convinced that our God is not done healing the sick. I am convinced that our God is not in, done restoring the broken. Our God is not finished, even though there is chaos seemingly all around us. I am convinced that Jesus is going to be faithful to complete what he has already started. God is not finished. I've shared with you kind of, we, we enjoy kind of remodeling and rest, restoring things. And, and over the last couple of months, we've been in the business of kind of redoing our guests out of our house. We've been ripping up carpet. We've been painting ceilings. We've been doing all of those things. We enjoy that. And as I've been thinking about that process, right, you do all of those things and to upgrade, right? You, you don't really tear out old to put old stuff back in there, right? You get, get rid of old appliances and you put new appliances in. You get rid of old insulation because it's not really keeping cold air in and hot air out anymore. More, right? You do all those things to improve what you had before. And I'm convinced that Jesus is constantly working in our lives and he's constantly ripping the carpet out of our lives and he's constantly ripping out old insulation and he's constantly moving and remodeling our lives, making us new. Paul writes as it is the process, those that are being saved, those that are in this sanctification process of life that we've already been justified through our faith. Right? We've been made right with God, but now every day we are growing in our knowledge. Remember, following Jesus is growing in the gospel. Right? It is us understanding more. It is God beginning to culminate and trim the vine dresser to come in. John chapter 15, Right? we talked about that. It is allowing God to come in and trim away us. Trim away our selfishness. Trim away who we are and replace them with His goodness and with His word and with His encouragement and with His truth. God's work is not dead. And there are times in life that we feel like that God is nowhere around us. That's kind of what we're, the direction that we're headed in the next couple of weeks. We're going to start a new series next week that we're calling Prayer Life. That, that as we pray, God really does still hear His people. That God really is a God who listens even though we feel like sometimes we're talking to the wall, even though we feel like sometimes God's not moving, even though we say, Lord Jesus, come quickly because everything's falling apart around us, just because life has stopped you does not mean God has stopped moving around you. Come on. May we be encouraged with the faithfulness of our God. 
Uh, even when I don't see it, Waymaker says, you are working. Remember, God is always at work around you, Joshua chapter 5. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, Paul says that he, and we know that the God who loves us is working all things for the good of those who love him. Come on. That's a truth. That's a truth that we can claim in Scripture. Good may not look good to us, but God's goodness is defined as perfection. Not just a good quality, not just it's okay. God's faithfulness for you and to his people is perfect and good. Our God is in the heavens and does whatever he pleases, the psalmist writes, and whatever he pleases is staying true to his promises. As we walk this treacherous road ahead of us in the next months, as school starts back and all this stuff happens, embrace the faithfulness of Jesus because God is not finished doing what he is doing around us and what he has done in scripture. Your life has purpose. Your life has meaning. Not only to the day that you die physically, but until the day Jesus comes back. Embrace the faithfulness of Jesus. Number two, embrace the community of faith. Number two, embrace the community of faith. Verse 7 says, It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me in grace, both in my imprisonment and in defense and confirmation of the gospel. They have stood behind Paul as he's begun to proclaim the gospel. They've, they've been with him. They've supported him financially while he's in prison. They've sent him gift baskets, if you will, as they've been in prison. Uh, like they've supported Paul. They've stood behind Paul. They've loved on Paul while he's in prison and when he's been in some really, really dark places. Again, look at what he says in verse 3. When I think about you, it brings my heart joy. It brings my heart satisfaction as I think about the relationship that we have with each other. And I, because I hold you in my heart, I love you, for God is my witness. God can validate this. God stands on my behalf. I'm telling you the truth. I yearn for you all with, infection, with the affections of Jesus Christ. God is my witness. I love you deeply. I care for you a lot. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. There is a truly, clearly defined relationship between the church at Philippi and Paul, is it not? Y'all help me out. Right? I mean, we see that, right? Paul yearns for these people. Obviously, these people care for Paul, or they wouldn't be sending him stuff while he's in prison. The reason he was in prison is for the defense of the gospel. So if they were scared about being in prison, they wouldn't be going to visit him there. True? I mean, I think that's kind of one, some things that we can infer about as we walk through this. There's a, a clear relationship, but not only is there a clear relationship, but there's a relationship between Paul and the church, and Paul's desire for the church that they would continue to grow they will continue to understand the gospel. They will continue to understand the faithfulness of Jesus. They will continue to understand and grow in knowledge and discernment of who God is. If you look back at Acts chapter 16, this is how the church starts. The conversion of a successful businesswoman wo leads Paul and his ministry team to come in contact with this demon-possessed girl. This demon-possessed girl gets on Paul's nerves so much that he casts the demon out. So now you've got a successful businesswoman, a young little girl, that was making her owners money. Well, when the demon's gone, her, all of her power's gone, so everybody gets all bent out of shape because this demon-possessed girl isn't making money anymore. So they get unraveled, again, because of what's going on in Philippi. Wait a minute, you're stirring the pot. You're kind of going against the grain of us having this easygoing lifestyle. Let's throw you and your team in prison. Well, one night while they're in prison, Paul and his team start singing. You use songs of praise to shake prison walls. That's what happens. An earthquake breaks out and all of the gates of the prison are open. Well, the Philippian jailer that's there who's on duty at that time, his punishment for losing prisoners was death. So because he knew that was on his horizon, surely they've all gone. Surely they've all left. All the gates are open. They're all gone. He is about to take his own life because he knows the shame he is about to go public with, and he's going to be executed anyway. But as he draws his sword to his throat, he hears a voice in the prison say, What are you doing, dude? We're all still here. He, and to his surprise, all of Paul's team is still in prison, and he falls at the feet of Paul Please tell me how I can know your God. 
The founding of the church was a successful businesswoman, a young girl, and a Philippian jailer. You can't find three different people than that. Uh, the successful businesswoman was, son, was someone who had money. The, the demon-possessed girl was someone who did not. The Philippian jailer was someone who would have been a hard-nosed Roman-type soldier who, whose punishment for anything wrong would have been public shame, humiliation, and death. Personalities are different. Walks of life were different. Things that they've seen were different. But they found common ground to grow the successful church that Paul yearned for and longed for. There's a community of faith because even though their walks were different, even though their stories were different, there was one thing that unified them. There was a Jesus that radically changed their life. And because of no matter what differences they had outside of that, there was that one thing that unified them together. As we gather together collectively as a body of Christ, there is one name that unifies us. Our walks are different. Our stories are different. Our races are different. All of those things are different. But Paul says there is one faith, one Lord, one church, one baptism, one Lord of all because of who Jesus is. We'll take a breath. There's a community of faith. People say, I'm very passionate about the church. I'm very passionate about what the church looks like. Not just coming to church. I'm, I'm passionate about church ministry and growing the church and equipping the saints for ministry. I'm passionate about that. And I've had conversations with people throughout my life. It's like, man, you know, I, I get church, but man, I don't have to go to church to, to, to have my Jesus. Like, I don't have to come to church. I don't have to be involved with church. Let's get out of the idea of coming to church. Let's, let's go into being the church, right? Let's, let's go that route. Because coming to church makes us think it's a building, and it's not. We are the church. We are the body of Christ. So, so being the church, I don't have to be involved with the church for me to know Jesus. Like, I don't have to do that. And I will agree with that. I will agree that you don't have to be involved with Jesus. But what I will say, based on what the Bible says, is if you are involved with Jesus, you will be naturally drawn to the church. There is a longing now because you find belonging in something. There's a longing now because you are unified. All of us in this room, all of you joining us online, wherever you worship, we are all unified under one truth. Jesus died, He rose, and I needed His sacrifice for me to experience salvation. Period. We may get bent out of shape about some doctrinal things. We may get bent out of shape about some styles of worship. We may get bent out of shape about versions of the Bible. But there is one thing we can't argue about. Christ died, was completely dead. He rose, and because of that, I have new life. We find unity around that one truth. Differences of stories, differences of life. This is where we find belonging. Do you think this was important for the church at Philippi? They were under constant persecution. Most of Paul's letters were to churches like this that were heavily persecuted. All the external pressures were pressing on the outside walls of the church because they didn't want them there. They were stirring up something new. There was a new ideology. There was a new thing. So Paul urges unity in all of his letters. Why? Because we have to stand together in a world that is disgruntled and in a world that is in chaos. We must be a community of faith. The church is where you find belonging, no matter what walk of life you come from. Ephesians chapter 3, Paul begins to talk about how uh, God's chosen race. Uh, remember, Paul believed that God called him to be the ministers to the Gentiles, right? Which were not God's chosen people. So Paul reminds the church at Ephesus in, Ephesus in Ephesians chapter 3 that, look, you were not God's chosen people, but because of the sacrifice of Jesus, you were strangers and now you're not. You were alienated and you were cut off from His acceptance, but now you're not. This is where we were. We were alienated and we were cut off. We were strangers and now we're heirs to the King. We now are sons and daughters of the King of Kings. We are now brothers and sisters in Christ. Oh, we don't need to use that term lightly. Because brothers and sisters fuss and they fight and they, they wrestle and they do all those things. But at the end of the day, there is a deep unifying love for one another because they are family. The church needs to be a place where we're not fake. The church needs to be a place where we can be broken people. The church needs to be a place where we don't have it all figured out because I hate to tell you, we don't. We don't have it all figured out. It is a community of broken people coming together, proclaiming the goodness of Jesus because He is King. Embrace the community of faith. We were not designed to do life alone. 
We don't have to do life alone. So let me encourage you in two ways and challenge you in two ways with this. Number one, be real when you come to church. Number two, allow people to be real when they come to church. Embrace the community of faith. It is going to be crucial for us to stand unified in the world, especially now. Number three, embrace the opportunities of life. Number three, embrace the opportunities in life. Paul says, I want you to know, brothers, I'm in verse 12, that what has happened to me has really served to advance the gospel. What's happened to him? He's been in prison. So he's saying that me being thrown in jail is actually good for the gospel's cause. So it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to all the rest that my imprisonment is for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. So he says, all of the staff here at the jail know why, knows why I got put here. It has become known that for this sacrifice, because I am so passionate and so committed to this guy named Jesus, that's why I'm here. All I have to do is say all of that's not real, and I could probably go free. But I'm telling you that, no, I am passionate and I'm committed, and all of these people know that. And not only that, not only is this a good thing that all of the staff here know who Jesus is or have at least heard about Jesus through my story, but also because of my passion and my root in Jesus, all of my brothers and sisters who were scared, they see my joy in prison. And they're like, okay, well, if Paul can have this joy in prison, then why can't we have joy outside of it? Why can't we experience the goodness of Jesus? Why can't we share the goodness of Jesus outside of it? So it's emboldening the, the disciples of Paul. They're emboldening the members of the church at Philippi because of his commitment to Jesus even in prison. Not only that, he says in verse 15, some indeed preach Christ from envy and rivalry, but others from goodwill. There was a group of people that hated Paul. Can you believe that? Can you believe that there are Christian people that hate other Christian people? Can you believe that? Who would have thought that was a thing? Come on, somebody. Paul, they couldn't stand Paul. They would, they would agree that Jesus was the Christ. They would agree on some doctrinal values that Paul preached. But they couldn't stand Paul. So because Paul was, out, was, was removed from the scene forcibly by being in prison, they said, well, now Paul was, had all this stage presence. Let me come on the scene now that he's kind of out of the way. But then there was another group that loved Paul. And so since Paul was removed, some, they had, somebody had to take up the slack. So they took up the slack and they stepped in in Paul's shoes. But what Paul says, I don't really care whether they hated me or they loved me. The point was that the name of Jesus was being made known. I don't care if they liked me or not. They were preaching the gospel. The latter do it out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former could proclaim Christ out of selfless ambition, not sincerely, but thinking to afflict me in my imprisonment. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or truth, Christ is proclaimed, and in that I will rejoice. Yes, and I will rejoice. Paul's in prison. It is dark. It stinks. He's probably chained to a guard. He's not 100% sure if he's going to get executed or not. He is on potentially death row. He's not sure yet. The, the verdict's still out at this point. But Paul says, not only am I having to deal with that, but I'm also having to deal with all of these external things that I'm hearing about all these people who hated me and they're preaching Jesus because they can't stand me. But then there's this group that's preaching Jesus because they do love me. But even in the middle of that, the gospel is being proclaimed and I will rejoice. I think if we're really honest with ourselves, we all want joy in life. Is that a fair statement and a fair assumption to make? No matter whether you are in Christ or whether you are thinking about being in Christ, you have questions about what being in Christ looks like, or whether you just flat out don't agree with anything that the Bible teaches. No matter where you are, whether you, wherever you find yourself in life, I think it is a fair assumption that we all want joy. We all want satisfaction. We all want the most of life because I think we all kind of have realized that life is really short. So we want to make the most of it. Whether whatever that looks like for us. Is that a fair assumption for me to make? Y'all help me out. If it's not, y'all tell me, but you know, I think that's a fair assumption. If, you, if you, you think about that, right? There's a lot of things that don't satisfy. There's a lot of things that, that really don't fulfill. There's a lot of things that really do find joy for a little season. But Paul says all of that stuff doesn't matter as long as Jesus is proclaimed. Every day is an opportunity to really choose joy or not. Because let's just be real. There's going to be somebody that gets on my nerves when I go to work tomorrow. 
there's going to be somebody that gets on my nerves whenever I drive down the road home today because they're going too slow. My wife just laughed at me. There's going to be people that get on your nerves, right? There's going to be people that get at you. But Paul says, I'm not going to tweet. I'm not going to post. I'm not going to complain. Christ is exalted, and I really don't care about anything else. I am finding joy, and I will rejoice that Christ is being made known because my circumstances are bleak, and I have every reason to complain. People are hating on me, and I have every reason to lash out. But in that, I'm going to choose joy. I am going to choose to be happy and knowing that Jesus is king. Joy is not based on what takes place around our lives, but it is rooted in knowing Jesus. So I wonder if we begin to look at situations and say, okay, this is an opportunity right here, instead of let me react. Right? Y'all feel me? Y'all tracking with me? That we embrace the opportunities in life. That every day there is some opportunity for you to choose joy and in that somebody's going to say, that was, that didn't make any sense. You have every right to be mad. You have every right to complain. You have every right to be upset. You have every right to be political and you have every right to do all this stuff, but yet you're choosing not to? Why does that make sense? Hey, look, as long as Christ gets the glory for it, I really don't care. Can you imagine what that would change to our attitudes if we begin to live life that way? Can you imagine how that would impact our marriages if we begin to live life that way? Can you imagine how that would begin to impact relationships at church if we begin to live our lives that way? That every opportunity that we had, we would say, okay, God, I am choosing you. No matter the outcome. Paul, Paul's outcome is pretty bleak right now. It's like, am I going to live or not? Am I going to die or not? I really don't know. But you know what? Christ is being exalted. Embrace the opportunities in life. Number four, embrace the promises of the gospel. Embrace the promises of the gospel. Verse 19. For I know that through your prayers and the help of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, this will turn out for my deliverance. Because you're praying for me, because you're for me, whatever I'm walking through in prison, it's going to be okay. As it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death. Very, I'm pretty sure we could all quote this, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I'm to live in the flesh, great. That means fruitful labor for me. Yet which I shall choose, I cannot tell. I'm hard, I'm hard pressed between the two. My desire to part will be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary on your account. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy in faith, so that in me you may have ample cause to glory in Christ Jesus because of my coming to you again. Paul says it very plainly, and I don't know that anybody has, could ever say it any better under the inspiration of the Spirit. For me to live is Christ. It is God's desire for me to take breath in my lungs. And for me to live, it's for Jesus. But for me to die... Man, I'm all in and I gain it all back. I'm double or nothing. I'm getting it all back because for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I don't have any more pain. I don't have any more sickness. I don't have any more issues. More than important than any of that, I'm with my Jesus. So Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. And Paul says, I'm really, really hard pressed between the two. Execution really isn't sounding too bad. Isn't that weird? Execution really doesn't sound too bad, but you know what? It, I know that if I die, there's going to be no one here to disciple you. Like, I know that there's, nobody going to, there's no, not going to be anyone to challenge you and to equip you with the Word. So I'm really, really hard-pressed between the two because I really love you, but, man, I really desire to be with my Jesus. So, but knowing that I'm, my purpose is to disciple you, I'm going to rejoice where I am even though I long to be with Jesus. I'm in prison, I'm in a very, very bleak situation, and all of these things are happening to me, but I know where I'm going. If you are confident in where you are going, it's really hard to get lost. We've been talking about true north. We've been talking about setting the gospel as our heading. We've been talking about walking in the gospel. We've been talking about walking in all those truths. God's design and sin broke that design and he brought us a choice and repentance and bringing Jesus back and brought that to us and that and salvation and the gospel, bringing us back to God's design. God's design is for you to walk daily with him. 
I was talking to my brother-in-law last night about Genesis chapter 3, when, when God comes into the garden, right? And the Bible says that the Lord God came walking into the garden. I believe that God was physically walking as a picture of God's design relationship with His people. That God's design is for His people to walk daily beside Him because He loves you that much. He's not just a far-off God, not involved with all the things you have going on. He's a God who's intimately and longingly involved with your life, walking with His people. So, in that... We've been talking about walking in that, and if we know all that stuff, it's hard for us to get lost. If you look at Paul's life, his biggest accomplishment was knowing who Jesus was. If you begin to look at Paul, especially reading through the, the letter to the church at Philippi in the book of Philippians, a little short book, if you have time, I encourage you just to read through it. His biggest gain was knowing who Jesus was. Philippians chapter 3, in verse, beginning in verse 4, if you just want to turn over there, he says, hey, I was a Pharisee, I was a, a Hebrew, I was not only a Hebrew, but I belonged to the tribe of, of Benjamin, I was a Roman, I wasn't just a Pharisee, but I was one of the, the head honcho Pharisees, and I was passionate about Judaism. And in accordance to the law, I didn't do anything wrong. If you look at the law in Judaism, man, I didn't miss a lick. I had it memorized. I lived it out. I knew it all. I had standing. I had presence. I had all of this stuff. But he says one little word. I counted all of that as rubbish, as loss, the, as dung is the literal word that he uses. And I'm not, not a very nice word for it. He counts it all as loss because he knew who Jesus was. He had all of these accomplishments, all of these accolades. He said, if anyone has a reason to boast, look at me. Here's my resume. But all that, let me rip it up, throw it in the fire because I know who Jesus is. And this is how we should live our lives. He longed to be with Jesus, but he understood that his purpose was for the advancement of the gospel. Look, we, we get that mixed up, I think, sometimes, that we, we long to be with Jesus. And that's it. But no, we eagerly anticipate going to be with Jesus, but understand that our purpose is for Jesus while we anticipate that day. Whether that's by our physical ending of our life, or whether that is by Jesus coming back in His glorious return. That time window from the time you experience the gospel to either one of those things is gospel-filled purpose for you. It is God saying, I am equipping you to go to a place where no one else can go. There are people in your life that I will never meet. Come on. There are people in your life that no one else in this room will ever meet. And those people need to know how Jesus radically changed your soul. There's a guy I know that we met when we served in Mexico a few summers ago. He chose to be a dentist. The reason he's a dentist is because he can share the gospel with people and they can't talk back. Come on. What if we lived our lives that way? That that was the way we thought. That every relationship, every opportunity for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. The worst you can do to me is kill me. That's probably not going to happen. The worst you can do is that, and if that happens to me, I'm better off anyway. So because I know the promises of Scripture, and because I know where I'm going, and because I know what my heading is, and because I trust the promises of the gospel and the good news of Jesus to me, then what is life going to do to stop me? My God is for me. Who can stand against me? This is our heading. This is our purpose. This is why God has called you from darkness into marvelous light, that you may be salt and light into the world around you. We are all secret agents of the gospel in our own sphere of influence. There's purpose. You see, Jesus was enough for Paul, and that gave him enough confidence to take on today. That was it. Jesus said, you're enough. A guy, uh, Paul said, Jesus, you're enough. And that was enough for him to take on today. Let me, let me put it to you this way. It's hard to sell a man what he already has. Think about it. Right? It's hard to sell a man who he already has. You can't sell me a 2017 white GMC Sierra with a scratch on the front of it because I hit somebody about a week after I bought it. You can't, you can't sell me one. I already got one. I don't need another one. You can't sell me a 12-pound dachshund who runs the house. 
I got one. I don't need another one because if I had another one, it'd drive me crazy. I don't need another one. What do I need one for? Come on. Y'all feel me? You, you understand? Maybe, maybe we think about it this way. If I said the word Nike, what's the first thing that comes to mind? That little swoosh thing, right? It has been branded as Nike symbol. Under Armour, maybe. When you see that A, you know that it's Under Armour. You know that that's their brand. You know when you see that swoosh, uh, Nike's apparel doesn't even say Nike on it, where you can see it most of the time. You just see the swoosh, and you know automatically Nike put that out there. Y'all tracking with me? Matthew chapter 4 is where we see all of this kind of come to a head. Matthew chapter 4, Jesus is in the wilderness. Y'all may remember this story. Well, Satan comes to Jesus, and Jesus has been out there for an extended period of time, so Jesus is a little hungry. He's been fasting and kind of right before he goes on to the scene in his public ministry. So Satan comes to Jesus and he says, hey, Jesus, you know, you're looking kind of hungry. How about, how about you turn those, how about you turn those, those, stop, those rocks right there into, into bread? Jesus says, no, I'm good. I got the, I got the, got the word of God and that's, that's bread for me. It's not that Jesus couldn't. We know through scripture that's not true. He took five loaves and two fish and fed, fed about 25,000 plus minus a couple people. Twice. We know he couldn't not do that because of what already transpired later on in Scripture. But Jesus says, no, I'm good. I don't need that. What I need is the Word of God, and that's what I'm feeding myself on. Well, Satan goes a little bit further and takes him up on a mountain and says, you know what, hey, Jesus, why don't you just jump off, man? I don't want to see all your angel armies coming to save you. Man, just jump off. Just jump off, man. All you've got to do is jump off and say, God, help me. And all, You know all the angels of heaven are going to come get you. God, uh, Jesus says, you're not supposed to tempt God. I'm good. Satan tries one more time and takes him up a little bit higher and he says, look, look, Jesus, look at all of that. Look at all that stuff, man. As far as you can see, look at that. I tell you what, I got a deal for you, brother. You bow and you worship me and all that, man, I'll give it to you. I'll give it to you. And Jesus says, no, bro, I'm good. I'm good. I didn't come to reign under you. I sure didn't come to reign with you. I came to defeat you and conquer you. You can't sell a man what he already has. We can't let culture define our identity if we know whose we are. Come on. You tracking? Embrace the promises of the gospel. Because there are going to be outward influences that try to sell you something different. There are going to be things that begin to shape your identity as a believer and as a person. There are going to be things that begin to shape you and mold you into the being that who you are. But you need to be very, very certain on whose you are. Anybody ever had a mama and daddy tell them, you know, hey, you go in public, you remember whose you are. Come on. As we walk, we are God's. God has branded us, his children. And as we walk out, and we know that, we know that we are loved. We know that He died for us. We know that He gave it all up for us. For me to live is for Him because He gave it all for me. For me to live is for a man who gave everything. He didn't have to. He sacrificially gave up His seat in heaven on my behalf so that He could come and suffer my pain and my death for me. If I know that, then it makes me eager to serve Him. And it makes me eager to want to be with Him. Come on. Embrace the promises of the gospel. As we close this time in True North, embrace this truth. Embrace that Jesus is faithful. And He is faithful to the end. God has not stopped being God even though the world is really, really dim and dark. Just because the, the dollar has lost value and we don't have any coins and I heard this week we're running out of aluminum so now we won't have Coke anymore. And to be honest with you, does that really matter? I mean, just really think about it. Just push pause. It does matter. So don't, don't hear, hear me try to not make light of the situation. Like, I understand all this stuff's a big deal. But God hasn't stopped being God and sitting on the throne because of all this stuff. Those are just things to distract us and start thinking that He isn't. He who 
begun a good work in you is faithful to bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Embrace the faithfulness of Jesus. Embrace the community of faith. I don't know of any other time that we need to be brothers and sisters than right now. We need to be a family of believers that are holding people to the Word. And when fear and trepidation and anxiety creep in, we need to be a people that speak truth over that darkness in our lives. We need to be a people that encourage. We need to be a people that we can say, look, man, I'm scared to. And I, we need to be able to absorb that and say, look, I, I am too, but I'm trusting this promise of Jesus. We need to be a people that can be real. We don't have it figured out. We can let down our walls or we should be able to. And shame on us if we're not allowing people to do that. That's what Jesus did. Embrace the community of faith. Embrace the opportunities in life. As you walk out of this place, there's going to be a choice for you at some point in time, the remainder of this day, to choose joy or not. There's going to be an option to be angry. There's going to be an option to spray fumes about something. There's going to be an option to be depressed, to scare, be scared. Those of you who have already started back school, those of you who may start back school tomorrow, there's an option. Embrace those opportunities. And you say, you know what, this is scary. This is weird. I am really, really upset right now. But Jesus, you know what, I want you to be known in this situation. So I'm going to take advantage of this opportunity and say, you know what, here's all of my feelings. God, give me you. Give me wisdom to walk in a step further. Embrace the opportunities in life and embrace the promises of the gospel. There is one thing I know that is certain in the midst of uncertainty, and that is the truth that is found in this book. There is a whole lot of uncertainty. There is a whole lot of I don't know. But there is one thing I do know. is The author of this book is faithful and true. The author of this book has given you wisdom, and giving you access to knowledge and understanding and love and acceptance. So as we close our time in True North, may the gospel be forevermore our heading from this day forward. That you are encouraged because you have purpose. That God is not finished with you. God is still working in our lives. God is still remodeling our lives. God is still reconstructing some things. That His promises have never returned void. God has never written a check and it bounced. And it never will. May all the chaos in today not make us very, very, very short-minded of the promises that we find in Scripture. For me to live is Christ and to die is gain. So I'm going to pray and I just ask you, as we pray and we respond, can we just pause? Can, can we just pause and you know what? Can we just reflect and say, God, uh, you know what? I'm scared. Maybe you are. Maybe you're not. Maybe you, you're not and I pray you're not. God, I've been derailed maybe. God, I've allowed all of the stuff and the politics and the junk and the things and external influence begin to affect the way I walk. God, I've allowed situations and these things in my life to take the joy out of my life. God, trim them away. God, you said you're the vine dresser. God, trim them away so that I can produce fruit. God, give me a draw to your church, your people. Whether that's here, I pray it is, or whether that's somewhere else, you need to find your people. You need to find a group of community that you can share brokenness in and exalt Christ with. God, remind me of the promises you've made. Your promises to me, God, may they always be ever-present in my mind. May I always meditate those day and night, God, that, that you're faithful to you to fulfill your promises. So can we do that as we pray? God, you are so good. And God, we declare your goodness. God, we declare your faithfulness. God, we declare your sovereignty. God, we declare your peace. We declare your promised life. God, I pray in these next few moments that, God, all the distractions, God, will be removed. And, God, that your spirit will just breathe a fresh wind and a fresh fire in our hearts and our lives. that, God, you would be made known and that, God, you would be made much of. 
God, may we, your people, respond as you speak into us in these next few moments. For the kingdom's sake, and it's in your name we pray, God, I love you. Amen. Would you stand with us as we sing? Thank mm-hmm. you.